Well, good day, Abba's children. Greetings to all of you called out holy ones of God and saints of God in the Messiah, our Redeemer. I think it's just so exciting to uh, personally get together with each of you. I really do. I, I enjoy it very, very much and uh, look forward to uh, get another session here today. I started out this way today uh, trying to remind us that we are of a different house, a different order, and a different kingdom when Abba, our Heavenly Father, calls us out of the kingdom of Satan, out of this Babylon that Satan is the, the, the king of, the Babylon we were in, and God calls us into Abba's house, into the Father's way, into his life and into his city. I wonder how many of us are really aware, as much as we should be, that we are not of this world, we are not of this Babylon, not because of any goodness in us, but because he's called us into a wonderful life as his children and bride to King Jesus, the righteous Son of God. We were once part of another city, once part of a group, a city called Spiritual Babylon. We once were part of a different woman, not the bride of Christ, but a filthy, evil woman described in Revelation 17 and 18 in particular as the end-time world order called Babylon, mystery religion, mother of all harlots. She's a mother harlot, and she has daughters. She's a mother. She's a mother harlot riding a beast system, a coming worldwide union of church and state, as well as a one-world military and economic union that's going to viciously attack God's people and any who don't go along with their evil ways. My sermon today... If you'll please turn, there's based on Revelation 18.4, where the Eternal has a sharp warning for those of us He calls His people. He refers to them as my people. When you combine this warning with the warnings to the church of Laodicea at the end time, we should really take note. And I think just as God says of the Laodicean types who do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, Revelation 3, He says you don't know it. I think those of us who are in Babylon don't know or recognize how much we are in Babylon. Among those in Babylon are God's people. He refers to them as my people, people of God. Some of those in Babylon may be the very same people who have also the Laodicean attitude of pride and just a lack of zeal. Listen carefully. Just as Lot's wife was told not to look back or go back, we are not to spiritually go back into the confusing Babylon we were once called out of. Just as Israel was told once they had crossed the Red Sea not to try to go back to Egypt, and those who tried were slaughtered, we are not to go back into the world system either. I preached to myself too. The sermon started as a personal study, frankly, to jar me awake as I see myself in various ways here and there, spiritually slipping back into Babylon. Then I thought maybe some of you may profit from it as well. There's a great angel with great authority who speaks in Revelation, Revelation 18 for God. And maybe in the final words there come out of her, my people, who knows? Maybe that's God himself or the one we know as Yeshua, Jesus the Christ, speaking. For it says another voice there. In this prophecy, we're very near the return of the King of Kings to establish God's thousand-year reign here on earth. Notice how pervasive and worldwide this influence of Babylon is as we read it. It's not confined to one geographic area of the world. In Revelation 18, verses 1 to 5, After these things I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. And he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen and has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit. This is an evil place, brethren. A cage for every unclean and hated bird. It's talking about spiritually here. For all the nations, all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. All of them are committing spiritual fornication with her. They're in her, if I can be so blunt. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And apparently some of God's people are too intimate as well. And the merchants of the world of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. Now notice particularly verse 4 of Revelation 18. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, 
doesn't say from an angel, doesn't say who the voice is. Come out of her, my people. Come out of this woman, my people, lest you share in her sins. Quit committing fornication with her. Quit being so intimate with her, lest you receive of her plagues. God's being very direct here. For her sins have reached to heaven. You see what it's saying? It says an evil woman and God's people somehow are being very, in, uh, very intimate with this woman. So that's the topic today. What are God's people doing in Babylon in the first place? And what does it mean to come out of it? To come out of her? God wouldn't command us to come out if we weren't in it. But what does it mean to come out? Does it mean to distance yourself from the point where you can't know your neighbors or join a chamber of commerce or be active in civic affairs of your community? Does it mean we have to dress funny, live in a commune, or live as a hermit? Is it a physical coming out? Will we physically leave this earth and get on some spaceship and go to some other planet or some other part of the world? Or is it a spiritual coming out? Or is it a little bit of both or neither? What is it? I hope and pray that you give this serious thought. And I pray that each of us, in fact, will even now pray that God shows us where and how each of us um, has started slipping back in Babylon, into Babylon. And that's one of the goals of this message, to get each of us. And what I say here today may certainly apply to you. It may not. But it may trigger some other ideas that will help you begin to uh, look and search and pray and humble yourself before your God to ask him, Father, how am I also beginning to be infiltrated by Babylon? How am I going back into this evil system in ways that I don't even know? And I pray that God will show you and me those ways in each of our lives. Turn with me now to Jeremiah 29. If you're in a small house group meeting on the Sabbath, a small house group, perhaps you'll want to pause the message after a couple more sentences here for two or three minutes and discuss what coming out of her, my people, means to you, to each of you, and maybe talk about it, and after two or three minutes come back to the message. I suspect that some of you won't initially agree with my assessment of what it means to come out, but what do you think it means to come out of her, my people? Okay, be turning with me now to Jeremiah 29 for a very intriguing passage. You'll remember that ancient Judah was taken captive by Babylon in 604 to 585 B.C., <clears throat> a series of massive ethnic cleansing type purges, a literal physical removal from the land of Judah, slaves chained together. God had prophesied that after 70 years he would allow them back to, Jer to Judah. In Jeremiah 29, <clears throat> verse 4 to 14, <clears throat> excuse me, thus says Yahweh of hosts, the God of Israel, to all who were carried away captive, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses, Dwell in them. God says, when you get into Babylon, now this, starting with this because it's an intriguing starting point. God was the one who sent them back into Babylon, in a sense, into captivity. Of course, they already spiritually were part of it. God says, all right, you want to be part of it? Then go and be part of it. You're going to be a slave. But God also says, when you get there, an interesting verse here, Jeremiah 29, 5. <clears throat> and I think it bears on finding the balance. We do live in Babylon. We do live in this world. Build houses and dwell in them. Plant gardens and eat their fruit. Take wives and beget sons and daughters. I'm reading Jeremiah 29, verse 5. And take wives for your sons and give your daughters to your husbands so that they may bear sons and daughters, that they may be increased there and not diminished. And seek the peace of the city where I've caused you, where I have caused you to be carried away captive. And pray to Yahweh, pray to the Eternal for it, for in its peace you will have peace. Have you ever thought of Israel and Judah, in this case, praying for the peace of Babylon? Have you ever thought of praying for Babylon? And yet God says, come out of her, my people, it's wicked, it's evil. So how do you mesh the two? For thus says the Eternal of hosts, the God of Israel, don't let your prophets and your diviners who are in your midst deceive you, nor listen to your dreams which you cause to be dreamed. For they prophesy falsely to you in my name. I haven't sent them, says the Eternal. You know all these ministers who say, the Lord spoke to me last night, or, or God said this, God said that. Well, you know, you don't hear me saying that very often, because unless I hear 
the voice of God uh, telling me directly, yes, God speaks to us in different ways, but I'm very cautious to say the Lord spoke to me and said, blah, 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 unless that actually happens. For thus says the eternal, after 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you and cause you to return into this place. For I know the thoughts I have towards you, says the eternal, thoughts of peace and not evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. Any of you who find yourself experiencing the curses of Babylon, remember this, that God will hear you if you will humble yourself and come before him and seek his face. He will hear you. And you will seek me and find me, Jeremiah 29:13, when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you. We can be found of God now if we will search for him with all our heart. The problem is many of us aren't doing it with all of our heart. I'm not yet. I'm not standing here before you as some holy, holier-than-thou person. I'm not. I'm sharing my Bible studies. I just had a heart-wrenching prayer to God saying, God, I've got to seek you more. I've got to pray more. I've got to find you more. I've got to spend more time seeking you out. And I will be found by you, says the Eternal, and I will bring you back from your captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I have driven you, says the Eternal. It says Yahweh, for I will bring you to the place from which I caused you to be carried away captive. God sent them as captives back into Babylon. And in that Babylon, God says, don't give up. Keep increasing and growing. But while you're in Babylon, pray for it and remember me. Come back to me. He's saying, remember, I am the eternal. I am the living God. I am the one who can bring you back. I am the one who can help you. Be in it, but not of it. I think that's the crux of this sermon, the crux of the scriptures I see. Uh, he's saying to them, pray for it, because in its peace you shall have peace. Turn with me to 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 to 5. 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 to 5. And therefore, we're even to pray for the leaders of this world, even though the leaders of this world, many of them are masons, Many of them are, are not God-fearing people. Many, some of them claim to be. When was the last time you prayed for President Bush or for your prime minister over there in Kenya or South Africa or Australia or Canada or wherever you are hearing this? Previously, did you pray for President Clinton? I hear ministers who like this president or dislike this president, and it doesn't matter. God says to pray for them, and the person that was in power when Paul wrote that was Emperor Nero. He wasn't exactly a God-fearing man, was he? First Timothy 2, verses 1 to 5, Therefore I exhort, first of all, exhort first of all that supplications and prayers and intercessions and giving of thanks be made for all men, for everybody. Man alive, that's pretty much everybody, isn't it? For kings and all who are in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. Pray for them, because like he said to Jeremiah, in its peace you shall have peace. For this is good <clears throat> for you to pray for a prime minister or president. This is good to pray for a governor, and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and come to knowledge of the truth. So living in Babylon, as we all are, doesn't mean we can't pray for its peace or for its leaders. We must, while we do that, remember that like our king, our kingdom is not of this world. As Jesus told Pilate in John 18:36, he said, My kingdom is not of this world, otherwise my servants would fight. And then he goes on the next couple of verses to say, my kingdom is not from here. He was referring to the fact that as he lived in this kingdom, this Babylon, this world, he was very aware he was not of it. We are not to be of it. I think that's the crux of the, mass, of the, of the passage of the, of the sermon. <clears throat> How are we of it? But consider these points if you think it means that we're to be as exclusivist, separatist, uninvolved with the people around us as some of you are. I want you to consider this because I think that is not what Scripture 
is telling us God himself sent his only begotten son into the world not to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved and he gave himself for it to save it not condemning it offering salvation to all who would be called and believe on him in the same way Yeshua our Messiah Jesus the Christ said that he had chosen his followers out of the world and they are not of the world John 15, verse 19. He clearly says the world would love its own. They don't love you because you're not of it. They won't. They don't love us because we're not of the world, but we live and work and function in it. Paul, God, through Paul, also tells us we are to be lights in a darkened world. Philippians 2, verses 14 to 16 says, Therefore, we need to be perfecting our lives and coming and growing in holiness and and righteousness and able to shine as lights in a darkened world. And our obedience to God should be obvious more and more as our way of life. If we restrict our activity only to being around those who are being called by God, we're shining our lights, brethren, in an already very bright room. Or at least we think it's bright. <laughs> but think about that. Would it not be better to take that covering over your light, take it off, and quit hiding your light? You don't take a, a, a light and put a bushel over it, Jesus said. We also know that Abraham and our spiritual forebears lived in Canaan, and yet Hebrews 11, one of the most wicked places on earth, and yet Hebrews 11 says they lived as pilgrims, looking for another city, another time, another kingdom. Hebrews 11, verses 8 to 10. That's our model. We live in the kingdoms of this world, but we are not of the kingdoms of this world. Our kingdom is the kingdom of God, and part of the message of this sermon is to get us to be much more aware of that every day of our lives. We're in the kingdom of heaven, where we're already registered as citizens, as its citizens, it says in Hebrews 12, 23, we're registered in heaven, and we're members of the household of God. Jesus said to rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Luke ten twenty. Hopefully we're already written in the Lamb's book of life. And just as Joseph and Mary had to register in the city of their birth, Bethlehem, Bethlehem, we are to that's how I think they said it. We are we are registered in our city, Jerusalem above. Heavenly Jerusalem is our city. The city God has built for the bride as her city. And yes, I am a U.S. citizen by birth, just as Paul claimed Roman citizenship by birth in Acts 22. But we're also citizens of heaven, and also by birth, but this time by birth in the Spirit. Can you be a citizen? The Bible says we are already citizens, not will be. Can someone be a citizen of any country, heavenly or earthly, unless they're born first? Can you have a mother, for that matter, without it being born? Jerusalem above is our mother. Galatians 4.26 says so. Scripture says is our mother, not will be our mother. In this case, we are citizens of heaven by birth in the Spirit. You can also read in Psalm 87, verses 5 to 6. It's pretty exciting. Of Zion it shall be said, this one was born there. Brethren, our flesh is a citizen of the country of your birth, our birth, but our spirit is a citizen of the heaven above. And that's why Paul could say that we come to heavenly Mount Zion, where we are registered, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. Hebrews 12, the end of it, verses 22 to 23. But too many of us are still completely immersed in this Babylon. So coming out of Babylon... Uh, is to be much more aware of the fact that we are of the heavenly kingdom of God. Our conduct, our speech, our way of life, our actions, our attitudes, every single day, every, every single person we meet, should ideally reflect where we're from. It should be more and more obvious to people that we're from a different kingdom. Just as it's obvious by accent, sometimes by behavior or culture or color, that other people come from other lands. 
than you might be used to. In the same way, as people interact with us, it should be very obvious that we are of another land. The hardest thing for us to do is to live in a way that shows a separation between our flesh and the spirit. And yet we must learn how to do that. We like to think of the church as our mother. That's not what the Bible says. You and I are the church. How can that be our mother? The church isn't our mother. Our mother, according to Galatians 4.26, is Jerusalem above, the mother of us all. Galatians 4.26, For me to have a mother means I've already been either begotten or born. And we who are begotten of God are still fleshly. We have flesh and blood. But please hear this. We are no longer regarded by God as being in the flesh, but are now already regarded by God as being in the Spirit. <clears throat> Romans 8, verses 8 and 9 says so. I, I'm amazed. I said that to somebody not long ago. And they said, what do you mean you're not in the flesh? Just prick your fingers and see if it bleeds. I said, well, I'm saying I am fleshly. But no, you do not want to be in the flesh. He says, but you are. I said, no, I'm not. Not anymore. <laughs> he looked at me like I was crazy. And then I read Romans 8, verse 8 and 9. And after we read it, he said, how come I've never seen that? I said, well, you see it now, I hope. Romans 8, 8 and 9. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you, Romans 8, 9, are not in the flesh, he says to the Romans. You are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. And now if anyone doesn't have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. So you're not in the flesh if you have God's Spirit. What's this got to do with coming out of Babylon? Everything. Everything. Because those, let me just make a note here, those who are in the flesh are still living the way of Babylon. Romans 8, 8 says, and Romans 8, 7 says that the carnal mind's enmity against God cannot please God and so on. So in our flesh there's no good thing. Romans seven eighteen says that. And we still have a flesh and blood body. And though our flesh lives in this world in a sense, in a sense we are considered in our spirit to live with God in the heavenlies, registered in heaven, and we're already considered its citizens, already transferred, already glorified, if, and that's a big if, if we remain faithful, if we remain faithful and endure to the end. Lots and lots and lots of verses will say exactly what I just said. Hebrews 12, 23, Romans 8, 28 to 30, Talks about having been glorified and justified and all of that. Now the final glorification will happen, of course, when we are presented before God our Father at the wedding. But brethren, before that, well, God sees the end from the beginning. And if we endure to the end, it's as good as done. Our names are already in the book of life. Unless we just do so many things that cause God to blot our name back out. Maybe the book of life will have a few blot marks in there. Names that were in there that God had to blot out. I hope that doesn't happen to me or to you. So, anyway, we've also just read who my people are. The verse we just read above identifies who the people of God are when he says, my people, come out of her, my people. Um, <clears throat> if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, the end of Romans 8 9, he is not his. So if you have the Spirit of Christ, you are his. You are his people. Romans 8, verses 14 to 16 says that those who have God's Spirit, who are led by God's Spirit, are his children. And if we don't have God's Spirit, we're, we're none of His. In the Old Covenant, the people who were called my people were Israel. Remember, uh, Moses was told by God to go to Pharaoh and tell him to let my people go. My people was the nation of Israel. You can also read that in the Old Covenant. The nation of Israel were God's people, Le Leviticus 26.12. But in the New Covenant... It is a new covenant. Some of you believe in a restored covenant. The word is new in the Greek. I've really looked at that. God speaks of the Israel of God. Galatians 6.16. The Israel of God. And that includes anyone who has God's Spirit, whether they're Gentile or Jew. Asian, Black, African, Indian, Jew, Latino, American, Brit, French, German, Kenyan. doesn't matter. 
If any of you are led by God's Spirit, you are the Israel of God, and you are God's people. Paul spends a lot of time in the book of Romans, Ephesians, Colossians, Galatians, and so many other books talking about how God has now called people from all nations and have grafted them into his spiritual Israel. And a Jew is now one who is circumcised of the heart and so on and on and on. <clears throat> so my people refers to God's children in whom flows God's spirit, whether Jew or Gentile. And everything we do is either feeding the spirit or feeding the flesh. It has everything to do with coming out of Babylon. Everything we do either feeds one or the other. The nature we're feeding is the one which will become strong in us. Paul said there's a war going on between our two natures. If you have God's spirit, you still have the human nature, but now you have God's nature as well, and there's a war going on, it says in Galatians 5.16. And that's why God says through Paul to quit feeding the flesh. I think it's incredible where it says in Romans 13.14, what do you do when you go shopping for food? You're going to go buy provisions, right? He says here, he puts it in Romans 13, 14, Therefore put on Christ and make no provision for the flesh. Those who are in Babylon are making lots of provisions for the flesh. They're indulging the flesh. Those who are coming out and have come out of Babylon are indulging the spirit and are living for the kingdom of God, not the kingdom of this world. So giving your flesh no provisions will starve it, make it weak, and make God's Spirit stronger in you as you seek Him and, and let God's Spirit flow in you, mightily flow in you. And it has everything to do with our topic. So we're sent into the world, but not to be of it. First thing every day... If we have come out of Babylon, we seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness. Or are we still doing that? Have we ever done that? We talk to God. We listen for instructions from Elohim, from our great Yahweh, by picking up his word, the manna from heaven, first thing in the morning before it gets hot outside. Remember, those were the instructions from God for picking up manna. Jesus later said in John 6, Eat of me, drink of me, I am the bread from heaven, and he who eats of me will never hunger, he who drinks of me will never thirst. He says in John 6 throughout it. <clears throat> if we're coming out of Babylon, we're seeking the leader of our kingdom. We need to take in God's word first thing every day. We need to make provisions for the Spirit David says, your word I've hidden in my heart, that I may not sin against you. Psalm 119, 11. We put on Christ, and Christ who lives in us now, and we accept his righteousness by faith. And if you haven't heard my sermon on that, please go back and hear the three-part sermon on righteousness. It has everything to do with this. But if Christ is now living in us, and if his righteousness has been bestowed on us and granted to us as a gift, Christ in me, Christ in you will live the way he used to live, righteously. So we can't claim to have Christ in us, but continue walking in the way opposite from the way of God. It doesn't, it's not compatible. But too many of us, rather than seeking first the kingdom of God, when we get up, we seek anything but. We seek a long shower. We seek more sleep, perhaps. We seek the first of all the news on the television or a hot, hot, hot cup of coffee or breakfast or time on the Internet. Anything but the manna from heaven. God says seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness. We can live in this Babylon but not be of it, brethren. We can. We can be lights in it but not partakers of it. I hope you're seeing what, 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 what God's telling us here. Now, we can be lights, but if we're feeding the flesh, we're inputting data, evil forms of entertainment. Some entertainment's good, but some's evil. Some evil websites on the Internet. Some of the Internet is awesome for what it can give you, in, in information. But it's also incredible, sometimes even by accident. I've come across inadvertently some see, my, my own website 
uh, had a dot in there uh, on one site that uh, made it a, a, a horrible site. It took you to a different site. It wasn't mine. And so it's very, very easy, very easy to feed our passions and our lusts. We've probably all done it one way or another, one time or another, one way or another, and it has to stop because that's providing for the flesh. Those things make Babylon strong in us rather than the kingdom of God. So we can live in Babylon as we are right now as long as God remains strong in us and he is our God and he's the one we seek and obey and we don't do the things that identify us with Babylon and its world. Turn with me now to John 17, 15 to 16, a very crucial verse in, in learning the balance in this, what it means to come out. <clears throat> John 17, verses 15 to 16. This is the prayer of Jesus Christ. He's just washed feet. He's had the Passover. Listen now to Yeshua's words. John 17, 15, 16, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world. I don't pray that you move them into some commune someplace or zoom them up to someplace out of here. Everyone wants to be raptured, it seems like. But God says, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. John 17:15 and 16. And then he continues in verse 18, And as you have sent me into the world, I also have sent them into Babylon, into the world. I have sent them into it. So what does it mean to come out then? Well, God's very particular when I say may freak some of you out. I hope not. Babylon is pictured as a whorish woman. I think when God says, come out of her, my people, he's being very frank, very blunt, very X-rated, if you will, but, but you know, perfectly frank. He's identifying an extremely intimate connection, if you will. Are you getting it? Actual whoredom with Babylon. Too much intimacy. Come out of her. He's, he's saying, quit committing adultery with her. And the, the verse before that says how all the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. You're being that intimate with this world that you're not being faithful to me, God is saying, but you're being pretty intimate with this world. Too intimate. Remembering we're told to come out of the whore, go back and read 1 Corinthians six fifteen to 17. And here Paul says, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? 1 Corinthians 6, verse 15. Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? You know who the harlot is? It's Babylon. You are a member of Christ. Certainly not. Do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit. One spirit. We are to live in the spirit, not in the flesh, in him. So Paul was saying back in, in, in to Corinthianize was 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 very very sexual activity and uh, Paul was saying physically and spiritually we are not to be involved in that kind of stuff uh, but to be uh, our intimacy our affection our 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 oneness needs to be with God and not with this world James 4 verses 4 and 5 talks about you adulterers and adulteresses know you not that the friendship with the world is enmity with God if you want to be a friend of the world you make yourself an enemy of God so God does have some jealousy and envy, he goes on to say, if we get too intimate with this world. First John 2, verses 15 to 16. And as we read these verses, I want you to ask yourself, what activities are you doing that you know in your heart that if you were to stand before God, that our judge and our redeemer and our Abba, for that matter, our Savior, Jesus Christ, would say to you, no, that is not of my kingdom. That activity, those thoughts, those places you went, those kinds of things you did are not of my kingdom. <clears throat> or neither did you ever seek me. Come to me and, and look for me and, and hug me and, and seek me first thing and say good morning, Father, and spend time with me. When was the last time you did that with me, God could say? 1 John 2, 15 to 17, do not love the world or the things in the world. We love the people, but not the cosmos. Not the. That's what it's talking about. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life 
is not of the Father, but of the world. And the world is a passing away and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. Are we getting it, brethren? He's saying we cannot, we cannot be a friend of this society and this kingdom. We're in it, and yet we need to be very, very different from it. Now, 2 Corinthians 6, verses 16 to 18. Being among the group that God calls my people, as you turn to 2 Corinthians 6, 16 to 18, means a two-way street. First, God has to be our God exclusively, uniquely. No foreign gods of Babylon, no distractions, nothing that comes first in our lives ahead of God because that then becomes a God to us. And then God gives us his spirit and we become his. First, he becomes our God. We respond to his calling. We repent. We make him our God of our lives. And then he gives us his Holy Spirit and we become his. He becomes ours. We become his. We become his. There's no other God we love, serve, or give time to. Second Corinthians 6, verses 16 to 18. What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of God of the living God. And as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. I will, wa- I will dwell in them, walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate. Don't touch what's unclean and I'll receive you. Now, as I've said, though, you have to take this with all the other scriptures, that being separate means we don't act like they act. We don't talk like they talk. We don't behave like they behave. We don't indulge in the sins that they behave in, but we are lights in the dark world. We do go to work and show what a good Christian worker should be like, that we don't use profanity, we don't use uh, F words and damn words and things like that. We We don't use words that are wrong. Sometimes, you know, we get mad and we might say a wrong word, and that's wrong. We need to clean up our mouths. So not being of Babylon means that we have to live our lives in such a way that every single day we start our day with instructions from our Master. We proclaim the Son of God as our King and Master. We eat of Him by digesting His words. And when we get His instructions in a daily meditative, contemplative prayer after we've heard from Him in His studies, and then we can go to work, live and act like lights in a dark world. We're sent into Babylon, but not of it, remember. If you're still thinking that, it, no, it's, it, it's more of a separation than that, how are you going to explain Daniel? Daniel was the number three man right there in Babylon. But here's the point. He was never of it. He was respected, but he was never one who would bow down to their idols. He continued to pray to God even when it was a dangerous thing to do so. Ditto his three friends. Same thing, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. All four of these men, Daniel and his three friends, were given Babylonian pagan names, but they never lost their identity with the true God. If you think coming out of Babylon means a total separation from being having any contact, how do you explain Esther, for example? She was the queen of Persia. She lived at the palace in Iran, Persia, the wife of Xerxes I. Her name was Hadassah, Myrtle. In Hebrew, they gave her a horrible name, Esther, which means star. And they meant the bright star Venus, another name for Ishtar, the pagan goddess of sex. But in all of this, she knew to whom to pray, to whom to fast, to whom to seek. Yahweh, the ever-living God. Yeah, she was there in Babylon, so to speak, in this case in Persia, but not of it. Had she physically left Babylon and Persia, by the way, with the 50,000 who did go back to Jerusalem, she would have never been the one used by God to save all the Jews alive. So think about that one. I imagine some of those who did actually leave Babylon and go back to Judah looked down on some of the ones who stayed, perhaps. But as long as they kept their light shining and kept the Sabbath, identified themselves as God's people, and those kinds of things, I don't know that God was against that. Esther's a perfect example. She stayed, and God used her mightily. And Mordecai, another one, 
Mordecai was used as, I think, number two or three man, of a prime minister or something, back there in Persia as well. Joseph, number two man in Egypt, never of it. One of the first people converted by Paul, by God, through Paul, in um, in the book of Acts uh, in, in, uh, in Athens, was Dionysius the Areopagite. And you look that up in Bible dictionaries and all that, they'll tell you he was a member of the Supreme Court. I've been on Mars Hill, in the area around Mars Hill. I've been right near there and around there when I was in Athens. And it's amazing how when you just picture Paul standing there, and here's a member of the Supreme Court. There's no verse in there that says they left. Nor is there a verse, by the way, that the, that, uh, the very first Gentile outside of the Samaritans who was uh, converted, uh, Cornelius, in Acts 10, there's no word there that he was told to leave the military. Interesting, isn't it? We get these concepts in our head, and yet uh, we don't know what happened to Cornelius after that. But he was a devout man, feared by God, a great example, a good light. And then we come to, um, let's do a quick review of what uh, the history of Babylon, just a real quickly. It goes back to Genesis 11. Babylon raises its head for the first time in Genesis 11, right after the flood. Smack dab in what we now know as Iraq. Babylon represented the supreme rebellion by Nimrod and Semiramis against the one true God. God clearly wanted everyone to spread out, to repopulate the earth. But instead, a band of rebels led by Nimrod decide to build a ziggurat or other kind of tower. It apparently was waterproofed uh, with pitch and tar. It says so right there in Genesis 11. And I think their motive was to say, okay, if God tries to flood us out again, we're going to have a tower we can all go into, and uh, it'll be waterproof. And so anyway... They basically dared God to send another flood. And um, what God did do, according to uh, other sources, is that he struck this tower with lightning and it burned like a great big candle after, after you know, to everyone around, and God destroyed it. Nimrod brought the people together as the original one world order, one ruler, one religion, one economy, and at that time, one language. And on the surface, it was one... United Nations, under one ruler. But they progressed so rapidly, technologically and scientifically, and they were all living long lives back then, and one language, that God says, now nothing they propose to do will be withheld from them. Do you grasp what God himself is implying here in that statement? There's no limit on what these people are going to come up with, he says. I have no doubt that the city, if you and I were to walk in it, even God walked in it, by the way. God says, Elohim says, let us go down and see what they're doing down there. And they walked in it. I have no doubt the city had a mix of good and evil, beauty and ugliness, high ideals as well as ultimate decadence, just like the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But it was in rebellion. And you know what God did? He confused them by giving the various groups of different languages so they couldn't understand each other. This forced them to have to spread out. And that's where Babel, Babel means confusion in the Hebrew tongue. Confusion is a confusing place. In this one chapter, we begin to understand what Babylon means. And it, Babylon surfaces again many years later under Hammurabi and Nebuchadnezzar and other kings before and after. And it became the first truly world-ruling empire, at least to the known world. Its culture, religion, power, ideology was so vast and so great. There were more gods in Babylon than you could count. Probably made them easier to rule the nations if they accepted parts of the religions of the nations they conquered. And you may be familiar with Daniel 2's statue that represents the four great consecutive world-ruling empires. Babylon was the head of gold. And the head controls the body and influences everything else, remember. Therefore, Babylon became symbolic of the whole world under its real leader, Satan, the adversary. In Revelation, Babylon is pictured as a whore, a woman riding a beast. Babylon is pictured as the religious system that will bring the whole world together as it unites church and state. So this Babylon, a woman, a whore, is a religion 
that is the glue that brings together the world together again in the end time. And it's already the system that's at work in all the nations. The whole world already is being influenced by Babylon. Over the years, many have speculated that this whore of Revelation 18 called Babylon is the Catholic Church. I don't think so narrowly myself anymore. I think it could be, but I don't think so anymore. I think the religion of the coming world war, world order, which will be the glue to bring together all the nations, tribes, and religions to come together, they'll be able to come together because they'll see elements of their, all their religions coming together in one. It will be a good compromise, they will think. It will mix, in my view at least, some Christ, so-called Christianity, Catholicism, Anglicanism, Eastern Orthodox, some Protestantism, some Eastern religions like Buddhism, outright paganism might be parts of it. It will include, I'm sure, some Shintoism, Hinduism, Baha'i, even some elements of liberal parts of Judaism. They might even have some elements of atheism so that everybody can join in this new age religion. One new world religion that becomes the glue for bringing the nations of the world together, categorized by ten economic regions, perhaps centered in Europe. They'll come together economically, but I think it will encompass much more than just Europe. I think it will encompass uh, parts of or the whole world, economically, religiously. Because the Bible says in Revelation 17 and 18 that all the kings of the earth and all the world comes and worships this beast and this Babylonian system. So in my view, it's possible they won't refer to Yahweh at all. The eternal almighty God whose son is Yeshua, Jesus the Messiah, may even be forbidden names that would isolate it too much towards the true God. So you'll hear more and more as the years roll by terms you've already heard that seem to be more inclusive. Instead of God or Creator or the Eternal or Yahweh or Jesus, you're going to hear words that you're already hearing and more like them. The higher power, universal intelligence, the God within, the good within, transcendent intelligence, universal love, Mother Nature, Mother Earth, the universe, Universal wisdom, and many other variants, instead of coming out and saying the eternal living God, instead of saying Yahweh, they talk about a higher power, whatever that higher power is to you. Beware of these code words. This is Babylon to the core. Even now as I speak, the U.S. military is taking steps to make it almost impossible to pray in Jesus' name. I heard it from a major in the army just recently, directly in our own home. Babylon has become synonymous with everything that is opposite God. So what did Babylon stand for, brethren? What did it stand for? Many try to identify Babylon with one nation or one city, one region. I think it may be headquartered in one city. I think it may be even headquartered in Europe. But I, but I believe Babylon stands for the way of life that's under Satan's world. I personally think it's broadest terms, in its broadest terms, Babylon means the world under Satan's sway. I personally reject that it means New York City, or even that it's limited to Rome. The USA and Britain will be taken captive by the union of the beast power and spiritual Babylon. So how can the U.S. or New York City be Babylon? Though it may be centered in Europe, possibly Rome, it clearly has worldwide sway. Several years ago, if you were to look at Rome and, and Europe, uh, you'd say they're weak. And yet just in a few short years, now the dollar is the one that's weak. The euro is now strong. The U.S. is now despised. Europe is now more admired. So it may be centered in Europe, but I think it's going to be based with kings all around the world, all ten regions of the earth. God rules over all, even in the kingdoms of men. That's what Nebuchadnezzar was told. And we can't resist authority lest we're resisting God, we're told in Romans 13, the first two verses. Having said that, we also know this whole world has been under Satan's sway, under his leadership. And that's why he could, that's why Jesus 
to be offered as a temptation by Satan all the kingdoms of the of the earth. They were his to give. Jesus didn't say, get out of here. You don't know what you're talking about because you, they're not your kingdoms to even give. That never came up. In fact, Jesus even referred to Satan as the ruler of this world in John 12:31. Right now he is the ruler of this world. John 12:31 in verse John 14:30 he says but the ruler of this world has nothing in me, nothing in me. He wasn't part of this Babylon. If you look at my transcripts, I'm going to skip over what's I think page 10 in the in the transcripts because Satan in turn, I just want to summarize it for time's sake. Satan in turn also then has evil spirits that he appoints over specific nations. In Daniel 10, Daniel had been fasting and praying in Daniel 9, and we come to Daniel 10, and uh, the good angel says to Daniel, I've come from God to give you this message, but I was stopped for three weeks by the king of Persia, talking about a bad angel uh, that had stopped him until Michael, one of the good archangels, came to, to help me. And then he says in, in Daniel 10, verse 20, 21, do you know what, uh, why I've come to you? And now I must return, Daniel 10, 20, 21, I must return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I had gone forth, indeed the prince of Greece will come. He says, I see a fight coming with the, the, the demons that are over the nations of Greece and Persia at that time. But I will tell you what's noted in the scripture of truth. So anyway, our main fight. Why did I bring that up? Because in this Babylon that we're having to come out of and be aware of, we need to be aware that this Babylon is ruled by evil spirits. It's ruled by evil spirits. And our main fight is not against men and women. It's not against um, kingdoms of this earth. It's not against the beast power and the, and the false prophet coming. The Antichrist is not against all that really ultimately. Is our real fight is against Satan and his powers. That's what Paul says, that we don't fight flesh and blood. But uh, our, our main fight is against principalities and powers in high places. And so we need to be aware that there's a war going on to seize each of us back and to seize your, to seize your sons and daughters back into Satan's kingdom of Babylon, out of the kingdom of God. And some of God's people are, are falling asleep to this war that's going on to lull you back, to grab you, to kidnap you back, to bring you back into their fold, to draw you away from God's purpose in your life. And some of us are taking the lure and we're reverting back into Babylon. Babylon's religion, Babylon's money, Babylon's pride, Babylon's goals and politics, Babylon's sex, Babylon's internet traps, Babylon's wasted time, Babylon's video games and chat rooms, anything to draw you away from God and holiness is something we need to be aware of, brethren. Now, also in the book of Daniel and Revelation, it makes it very plain that this end time Babylon will be dominated by one man called the beast power who will be given authority and power by ten kings who represent ten economic regions of the world. Some think the ten kings will be ten kings in Europe. I don't think it's correct because Scripture is clear, though it may be based in Europe, that the ten kings represent the entire world. The entire world giving their allegiance to this beast power. And if you don't participate in it, in the 666 beast system that Revelation 13 talks about, and other places, you and I won't even be allowed to function. We won't be allowed to buy or sell. And if we don't function in this society, at some point we will lose our heads. We'll be beheaded. God warns us when that happens not to be involved in it or else we'll have our names blotted out of the book of life. Brethren, take this very seriously. I don't want to turn this into a prophecy sermon, so read Revelation 13 on your own. But this coming world order will be very, very fearsome, very powerful. It will be worldwide, around the world. It will not be limited to Europe. And then in Revelation 13, verse 7, 
it says very clearly, it was granted to him to make war, the beast power, this one world system with Babylon, the religion, the being the glue that brings it all together, but dominated by a Hitlerian type of charismatic military ruler called the beast. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, at least temporarily. Are you hearing that, brethren? Some of you think you're all going to be raptured out. There won't be any true saints left. It says right here he's going to make war with the saints and overcome them. And authority was given to him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. Over every tribe, not just Europe. Every tongue, every nation, not just the United States. For those of you who think that. All who dwell on the earth, not just those in Europe, not just Catholics, not just Protestants, not just pagans. All who dwell in in the world. It says, all who dwell on the earth, I'm reading Re- Revelation 13, 8, whose names are not written in the book of life will worship him if they're not written in the book of life. Okay, all who dwell on the earth, all brethren, not just Europeans, not just Americans, whatever. So riding the beast is a religious system called a whore in Revelation 17 and 18. And this whore will be led by a religious leader that will have such great miracle working powers that if possible they come close, almost deceive even the very elect, Matthew 24, 24. If it were possible, they could even deceive the very elect, but it doesn't sound like they'll get the very elect necessarily come awfully close. So, we need to be very, very, very aware of the system I'm talking to you about. We don't know exactly how all this is going to come down. I certainly don't. I haven't had a voice tell me anything. I'm not going to claim to. But keep your eyes open. We do have the Word of God. And whatever happens, we must never be of the world system or take on that number or, or in, any way, uh, in any way deny Jesus the Christ or Yahweh or we will incur God's wrath and have our names blotted from the book of life. There's much more I can say about that, but time doesn't permit it. So let's get back to Babylon here. Babylon, to me, and coming out of it, is any of the world's ways, gods, lifestyles, culture, practices that take us away from an intimate relationship with the one true God. Babylon is confusion. That's what Babel or Babel means, to confound. In the Babylonian language, their city means the gate of God, but not the one true God. But in Hebrew, Babel or Babel means to confound. So what does Babylon stand for and what must, must we come out of? Well, first of all, its very name, confusion. If your life and my life resembles confusion, God's not there. God is not of confusion. The words author of aren't in the original Greek. God is not of confusion, but of peace. Where confusion is, God is not. Look at your life. If it's confusing and out of control, that's the Babylonish way. Coming out of Babylon includes bringing godly order into our lives. If you're feeling all confused, don't know what to do, life is too hectic, and my life has often been that way, I've had to repent of it and say, God, that's not of your way. Your way is to rest in the Lord. Your way is to have peace that you're watching and guiding over us. That We don't have to be so frenetic and frantic and hectic. That you will watch over us if we do our, if we do our, our best and seek first the kingdom of God. Then all these things that we seek will be added unto us. God's way is to realize he has a will for us. Perhaps we need a sermon on discovering God's will in our lives. In any way, in any case, the child of God says, Not my will, O God, but yours be done. We beg God to show us his perfect will, and we try to live in perfect harmony with that will. God's life is a life marked with peace, of knowing God in the midst of it. That peace that comes where he could even sleep in the stern of the boat, remember when it was in the midst of a storm. If your life is in the midst of the storm, if we have God in us, we should have a peace in us. I'm not there yet, brethren. I'm telling you what, I read, what I'm read, what i reading in Scripture. 
And if we really, really had the peace of God, if we really had the faith, if we really were close to God, our lives would resemble peace and order and not confusion. That's the first point. The second point is Babylon, when I say what does Babylon stand for and what do we have to come out of? Babylon also represents pride. Oh, pride galore. Babylon is all about making a name for yourself rather than lifting high the name of God. We can do this by our work, by recognition from peers, from society, or whatever. That's why I resist putting anything on my website that's about me. It's not about me, you see. It's not. It's about God. That's why the name of the website, website is not my name. The name of the website is Light on the Rock. He is the light. He is the rock. He's all of it from start to finish, A to Z, Alpha to Omega. So we need to be lifting him up and not ourselves up. And oh, I've seen awful pride in me. There's been always more to discover as God peels away the layers of pride that I have. And I'm sure you have. God hates it. Do a study on pride. He absolutely hates it. That's what's in the latest sins. I heard a good sermon showing that. The latest sins was more about pride than it was about being lukewarm. They were very proud. They don't need God. Just like in Genesis 11:4. These people who are building Babylon said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. Let us make a name for ourselves. God hates this kind of pride. God hates it. And so they were trying to, make a, they were trying to build a city in their own image. And, and this world and Babylon is about image. Isn't it? The image makers. It's all about that. It's all about the way you look and feel and come across. God hates it. We're to be conforming to the image of the Son of God. Romans 8.29 Not to the image of society and how they tell us we should be cutting our hair or dressing, what kind of shoes to wear, what kind of watches to wear, what kind of pens to write with, how we shave our beard or our mustache or not. I think pride and Babylon and image go hand in hand. God's never changed. Humble yourselves, and then he will give you grace to raise you up in his time and his way. Second Chronicles seven fourteen to 15 is still in the Bible. If my people, there's that term again, who are called by my name, the church of God, the bride of Christ, Christian, if my people who are called by my name, will humble themselves. Humble themselves. First thing. That's the first thing. And pray. You know, if you really do pray with the right attitude, you first have to humble yourself to understand you have to bend the knee, that you need some help, that you have a maker and a ruler, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and heal their land. We are the house of God. We're supposed to also be the house of prayer. That's what the house of God is. Are we a humble house, a house of prayer? Are we a clean house for God's holy presence? Would God recognize your life as a house of prayer? I have a message on my website about being a house of prayer. In Daniel 4, verses 25 to 32, Nebuchadnezzar typified this pride I'm talking about. Daniel 4, 25, the king, verse 30, actually, the king spoke saying, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty? And that just struck God the wrong way. I'm sorry. I'm not sorry. And God struck him down and made him like an animal for seven years. Until you know the Most High rules in the kingdom of God and gives it to whomever he chooses. In fact, earlier it says, to the lowest of men. Pride, brethren. If you want to come out of Babylon, look for ways that we and I are proud and where we need to resist that. Babylon was a defiant rebellion against God instead of obedience. Any way that we're not in obedience to God is Babylon. Babylon was about seeking their own will their own goals, their own agenda, their own wealth, their own agenda, their own schedule. 
Babylon was about false gods instead of the one true God. It's about false religion. Do you understand that the religions that we even call Christian today have taken so much paganism into their Christianity to the very days of the week that we call Moon Day and, and Thea's Day and Woden's Day and Thor's Day and Freya's Day and Saturn's Day. And we call them we call the planets by names of gods, abhorrent to the great God of Israel. We use names in our words in our vocabulary, fortune, echo, siren. All of these are words that come from ancient gods and many more. And we worship on the day of the sun. And many so-called Christian groups do instead of on the Sabbath day. And all this comes from Babylon, brethren. Seeking money, wealth, status, impact, domination. Babylon was all about power. The brethren, any of you listening to this, if you're part of the groups that have their grand exalted ruler, the grand poobah of some kind, get out of it. Get out of it. It's not of God. Even those of you who have who are ordained ministers, have you remembered that our master says, don't be like the Gentiles in the Babylon of this world? He says, he says, don't lord it over others. Remember you have one lord, one master, one teacher. Don't be called reverend. Don't be called an apostle unless God has told you you're one. Don't be called the grand poobah. Don't try to lord it over people. When a pastor or minister becomes a big mucky muck, He's becoming a part of Babylon. It's walking away from the kingdom of God. Yet minister after minister falls into that trap. They forget that their name minister means servant. Avoid titles, director, exalted ruler, and so on. Micah 6, 8 lists what God values more. He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with your God? That's what God wants. Walk humbly. Love mercy. How merciful are you? I saw a program last night about how AIDS is just decimating Africa. Fathers and mothers are dying and even the orphans have AIDS. Some of them born with it. When you see a show like that, are you saying, well, God's just wreaking the results of the sin of promiscuity? And yes, that is true. That's part of it. But what about those orphans? Does your heart bleed for them? Do you pray thy kingdom come? Did your, does your heart stir a little bit? Do you sigh and cry for the abominations that are we see and the impact of those abominations of this Babylon? In Ezekiel 9, it says that those who do so will have a mark put on them from God, protecting them. Brethren, are you a merciful person? Do you look at the winos and the homeless, or people you assume are homeless are all winos, so therefore you never help anybody like that? God be merciful to you, because God's going to judge you as you judge others. God's going to say, okay, the way you've treated others and the judgments you've used on others will be the standard I use on you. And brethren, I don't want to be that way because I need all the mercy of God I can get. And so do you. So do you. Babylon was the other way. Babylon was merciless and tough. They even sacrificed babies. Babylon was about mindless pleasure Illicit sex. It was the sin city of its day. For example, even Vegas today calls itself sin city. They revel in it. I don't see how a child of God can go to Las Vegas without feeling the evil of that city. I know the last few times I've had to be there on business. I could hardly wait to get out. Yeah, they have some shows that are incredible. But everywhere you go, all over the sidewalks, everything is... Sex, sex, sex. Everywhere you go. Everywhere. They're handing out cards with pictures of topless girls. And they're, they're strewn all over, all over the sidewalk on down the strip. 
brethren, are we getting into the sins of Babylon? If you would enjoy that kind of city, you're in it. The Internet, what a blessing it can be. What a gateway it can also be to a wide world of evil. Anything imaginable. I think you're going to find casual sin, casual sex. It will become more and more available. And I've got to fight it. I've got to fight it. I'm a man with hormones just like anybody else has. And I've got to fight it day in, day out too, brother. I fight it by the Word of God. But if I feed the flesh, that's where I'm going to go. That's where you're going to go. But if we feed the Spirit of God and live by the Spirit, we don't have to fear these things. Brethren, please look and see how you're being affected by Babylon. Even some of the holidays that we observe in this land, Christmas and Easter, Halloween, that's straight out of paganism. Jesus wasn't born December 25th. Look at my message on the that I put on the website, the true story of Jesus' birth. Go back and listen to it. Brethren, that's not the truth. Uh, I mean, Christmas isn't the truth. The truth is what I present there, straight from Scripture. <coughs> In fact, if you listen to the History Channel on TV, sometimes they will show you right around Christmas time, certainly around Easter and Halloween, the pagan roots of the way of those Christian, uh, so-called Christian practices. We got to come out of that, brethren. Don't worship God the way the pagans worshipped Him. Have nothing to do with that. Now keep in mind that God's people have always been called out. Abram, Abram was called out of Ur of the Chaldees. In fact, something very interesting. If you go back and look at Genesis 11, the end of it, and the first few verses of Genesis 12, you'll see that in fact Abram's father had uh, Terah had actually taken Abram and, and Lot and, and, and had gone to go to Canaan. I'm reading Genesis 11, 31, 32. And then they stopped at a place called Haran, maybe the father, maybe named after Lot's father. And they dwelt there. Maybe, I don't know what happened. Somebody must have died there. Terah eventually dies there. And um, But the point is they were being called apparently out of Ur to go to Canaan and they stopped. God then goes in chapter 12 and says to Abram, he says, hey, don't stop. Leave your family. Get out of here. Go to the country I told you to go to. And I think many of us go part way and then stop. And God says, don't. Don't don't keep doing that. You keep going all the way instead. Go all the way. And so Abraham does, does that. He lives as in a foreign country. He waits for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God, it says in Hebrews 11. Brethren, we're not of this world. Come out of her, my people. Don't share in her sins. Don't be like the world. People of Babylon should clearly sense something very different about you and me. And we have a long way to go. But if we let Jesus live in us, they will see a change. They'll see we're nice, we're gentle, we're sweet, we're loving and kind and patient. All the things I'm not yet, by the way, I'm not claiming to be those things yet. I don't say that with any satisfaction. But I know that if I let Jesus rule in my life more and more, that I will be a sweet and gentle and sweet person. We do need to be different. Coming out of Babylon means to focus on activities that draw us closer to God ever, ever more. Anyway, I'm out of time. I do need you to go back and pray for God to show you, brethren, where you need to take stock in your life and where you and I each has to come out of Babylon. I pray that you will get on your knees. I pray that you will get a sheet of paper and a pad of paper. Get on your knees and cry out to God and just say, Father in heaven, holy God, righteous God, show me how I'm beginning to go back into sin, go back into Babylon, get back into the world. Show me how I'm not as close to you. Show me the things I've, I need to do. Show me the places I need to repent of. Show me the sins I've got to stop in my life. Show me the sins I've got to cut off in my life. And then be ready to start writing because if you're really praying to the true God of heaven and if your heart is one to seek Him and humbly ask Him to show you, He will. And you better start writing and you will start writing because you're going to start hearing and seeing and, 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 and recognizing all kinds of things that need to change in your life. The way you treat your wife or husband, the way you treat your son, the way you treat people in general, focusing on things instead of relationship, 
not putting God first in your life, not getting up first in your life and seeking the manna of God's will, uh, seeking God's will in your life instead of instead of trying to uh, work things out all the time by yourself. All of that's of Babylon. Trying to be powerful at work, trying to be powerful in your church, trying to be the grand pooba, the grand mucky muck, acting like you're somebody when God says you're one five billionth of less than nothing. All the nations are less than nothing, he says. That makes me and you one five billionth of less than nothing. When we come to see that and humble ourselves and seek our God and turn from our wicked ways, then he will hear from heaven and heal our lands and answer our prayers. Brethren, that's what we need. We've got to come out of Babylon. Come out of her, my people. Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins and receive of her plagues. Brethren, I hope, I hope you listen. I hope I listen. I hope we all come out, come all the way out, and put a renewed effort and quit fornicating with this world. Quit fornicating with this system. Quit being so intimate with something that's not of God. Come out of her, my people. Instead, come close to God. And know instead what it means to be in God. To be in Christ. To be in God's Spirit. And God in us and us in God. And the intimacy that that reflects. I'm going to talk about that soon. We have the opportunity to be in Christ now in this life. To be in God now. But not in Babylon. We cannot be in God and in Babylon at the same time. We cannot be worshiping God and worshiping demons and idols. We have to come out of Babylon all the way out, brethren. Anyway, I hope we come all the way out and put a renewed effort into coming to really know and to be in Jesus Christ and in his Father Abba, the Eternal in the Highest. Until next time, this is your servant and your brother in Christ, one five billionth of less than nothing. Until next time.